Hello everyone. I am Manavendranath Bera, a theoretical physicist and quantum information scientist from India. I am also a member of the organizing committee of this convention. On behalf of the International Organizing Committee, I welcome you all to this convention. Scientists play a crucial role in developing a true understanding of nature and its application in technology with the dream that scientific knowledge will be used for the progress of humanity. The scientific community notes with deep concern that while the financial support for scientific and technological research is dwindling, science and technology are increasingly being used to destroy humanity. Most advanced countries are nowadays heavily dependent on armament production for the survival of their economies. And only wars can guarantee the demand for these killing machines. So we see constant warfare, big and small, being waged in different parts of the globe. And most advanced economies as armament suppliers are complicit in the crimes against humanity. At crucial junctures of history, like wars, etc., when science is misused and abused, scientists have not hesitated to come forward to protest and mobilize public opinion against wars and the devastation of people's lives. In a similar situation, we cannot be just bystanders to the massive human calamity that is currently brought down in Gaza by Israeli forces. Driven by these concerns and an urge to raise collective voice against the destructive use of science and in particular ongoing genocide in Gaza, the Breakthrough Science Society, a voluntary science organization in India started an appeal to all well-meaning concerned scientists the world over to raise their voice of protest, to stand by the people of Gaza and to raise their collective voice to demand immediate permanent ceasefire, compel the powers to ensure a lasting political solution to the Palestinian problem and thus assure that the Israeli and Palestinian people can exist and coexist in peace and harmony. This appeal was supported by more than 1300 signatories globally and was sent to the United Nations. Many of the scientists who signed the appeal expressed their willingness to organize follow-up activities and accordingly, after consultations with many scientists and with the objectives of uniting the scientific community to intensify its voice against war and genocide, the Breakthrough Science Society shared a proposal to organize an international convention against war and destructive use of science. Through this effort, an international organizing committee composed of 19 scientists from different parts of the world was formed in mid-November to organize the convention. Important science organizations like Science for the People, Scientists for Palestine, Saving Humanity and Planet Earth, Gift of the Givers Foundation subsequently joined and endorsed the initiative. The culmination of this effort is this convention. More than 1,100 professors, scientists, medical professionals, scholars have registered for the convention of whom we can see that nearly 250 participants are present in Zoom meeting. Many more are watching in it on live and YouTube. Many more are also joining. With this introduction, we now move to the first part of the program. Before we start, I mention the rules to use Zoom and the method of participation in the discussion and voting during and later in the meeting. So for that, I shall be sharing a slide. Just give me a moment. So here is the rule to use the Zoom. All attendees are allowed to chat with the host and the co-host only. All participants are by default set at mute unless allowed by the moderator to unmute themselves. Polls will be available following each amendments and discussion under consideration. 
you will see this as a pop-up window and you need to select the option that you agree with. For example, that will be option one and option two, and you have to choose out of them. File sharing is restricted on chat for security concerns. Improper conduct will lead to suspension from the meeting. With this, now I shall invite the keynote speaker of our convention, Professor Richard A. Falk, to speak on the situation in Gaza. Let me introduce him. Professor Falk is Milbank Professor Emeritus of International Law at Princeton University and Visiting Distinguished Professor in Global and International Studies at the University of California, Santa Barbara. In the course of his long distinguished career as a scholar and activist, Professor Falk has authored and co-authored numerous books on global governance, crime of war, militarism, weapons of mass destruction, and related themes. During 40 years at Princeton University, Professor Falk was active in seeking an end to the Vietnam War, a better understanding of Iran, a just solution to Israeli-Palestinian conflict and improved democracy elsewhere. Professor Falk serves as chair of the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation's board of directors and as honorary vice president of American Society of International Law. In March 2008, the United Nations Human Rights Council appointed Professor Falk to a six-year term as a UN Special Rapporteur on Palestinian Human Rights. Professor Falk is therefore most eminently qualified to address our convention today and to frame it in the context of urgency for scientists to raise up in opposition to ongoing monstrous devastation of Gaza and against wars and militarism everywhere. I request Professor Richard Falk to deliver his talk on the situation in Gaza. Professor Falk, please. Uh, thank you so much for that very gracious introduction. Uh, I find the initiative that the organizing committee has taken in producing uh, this convention to be a glimmer of light in a dark sky, a dark sky that is uh, dominated by a, the most transparent instance of genocide in human history, where because of the capacity of uh, worldwide media to show the daily unfolding of this terrible criminal action in Gaza and its related effects on the uh, in the West Bank as well. The peoples of the world are exposed as never before to the concrete reality of genocide. It has always been in the past something relatively abstract from our consciousness. Here in Gaza, it is not only a visible reality for the peoples of the world and the governments, the leaders and those in international institutions, it is also something that is reinforced by the explicit endorsement of such an approach to conflict as uh, has been embarked upon uh, by the leadership of Israel. Uh, never before has such a candid admission that one is striking against uh, the, the people as a whole cutting off their food and fuel and 
electricity, bombing their hospitals and places of shelter, targeting places where children and women gather. So it is a horror story that makes this kind of initiative against militarism as epitomized by what is happening in Gaza, such a dominant uh, preoccupation of anyone with a global conscience to motivate them uh, to feel that they must act responsibly in light of such developments. Let me mention briefly my experience uh, with uh, militarism and war making, uh, having taught as was said at Princeton University uh, for 40 years, I was surrounded by some of the uh, world's leading scientists, including uh, Robert Oppenheimer and Freeman Dyson and others of uh, global stature. And what intrigued me was the degree to which these uh, outstanding scientists were enticed by the uh, opportunity to have an impact on government policy and to feed the militarist appetites of uh, the private sector, which uh, has thrived through the years on the exaggeration of security threats and the projection of American power worldwide. And this kind of unhealthy connection between uh, scientists and government policy, which is probably more extreme in both its character and effect in the United States than elsewhere, uh, the degree to which uh, the U.S. is the greatest, has the largest military budget and also is by far the largest uh, arms sales person, the largest uh, purveyor of the merchants of death, in effect. Uh, the other ex reinforcing experience I had was to uh, visit the strategic centers of global policy, global security policy in the United States, and uh, take notice of two kinds of personalities that one encountered there, uh, which would. They, these were venues dominated by scientists. One was a uh, feeling that by contributing to the military development of weaponry and doctrine and so on, scientists were somehow doing something in the quote-unquote real world and that this was a, a source of almost a kind of uh, careerist uh, excitement for them. And the other kind of uh, scientific personality were people who didn't know a great deal about politics, but were uh, in, uh, indoctrinated into the prevailing ideology of the time, and were uh, Cold War activists uh, in, a, in a very superficial, but let, led them to believe that their work as uh, helping with the development of weapons and the worst kind of weapons 
uh, was something that was positive, that it contributed to uh, a better world. In other words, ideology underpinned this enthusiasm for connections with the militarism that was broadly present in the society and very, very salient, uh, at least in the United States, throughout uh, the entirety of uh, the Cold War. And actually, after the Cold War, because it saw the opportunity with the uh, collapse of the Soviet Union to become the unipolar dominant presence in the world and didn't have the imagination to choose anything other than its military dominance as the path to this kind of uh, role in international political life. And this continues to be the case. And I focus on the United States partly because I know it best, but also because I think it represents, uh, it, it's in, in its own way, it's a powerful metaphor for the distortions that arise from this marriage of militarism and knowledge as filtered through uh, the brilliance of the world's uh, finest scientists. Uh, this this uh, kind of initiative uh, that you all are part of is a an overdue reaction, and perhaps the extremity of what's happening in Gaza made many of us act in ways that we were not uh, motivated to act before, that it, that it overcame uh, a human tendency toward complacency and a feeling of helplessness about these larger issues. But I think that one of the uh, revelations of this uh, outbreak of genocide in Gaza is the helplessness of the formal structures of war prevention and the protection of peoples against abusive behavior. The the UN, which was uh, created as a war prevention uh, institution after World War II, has, was in a sense designed to fail because it gave the five most powerful countries in the world the uh, authority to block any kind of effective response uh, that might uh, oppose or uh, neutralize uh, militarism and aggressive and criminal, criminal uh, undertakings in the course of war. It, what, it, this awakening which I think is happening in many domains, not just among scientists. I'm part of a parallel initiative of so-called global intellectuals that is similarly awakening to the fact that if the peoples of the world do not take responsibility, uh, nothing effective will be done to curtail the menace of militarism and war. And, and so this is very important. There's one other general factor that hasn't often been taken into account. That dis in the, despite this surge of militarism uh, in the post-Cold War 
and uh, present world, militarism hasn't produced political results. It's actually proved to be dysfunctional in a series of symbolic activities that sought to bring to bear military superiority as a way of uh, controlling the political outcome. And the assumption of those that make foreign policy for almost all leading governments is that uh, history is uh, history is constituted uh, by those that prevail in military conflicts. That, in other words, that war and militarism have historical agency. But recent international experience defies that understanding. And the U.S. Uh, especially should have learned this uh, by its experience in the Vietnam War. In, Viet in that war that lasted almost a decade, the U.S. had complete military dominance, yet lost the war. And one has to understand that the lessons of that de political defeat cannot be learned by these militarist uh, governing elites because there's too strong a vested interest in persisting with the belief that military agency is what controls political outcomes and shapes history. And if uh, Vietnam wasn't enough of a, uh, a pedagogic experience, then the 20 year commitment to state building in Iraq and in uh, Afghanistan should have been a br breakthrough in some kind of political consciousness. But again, the energies of uh, the militarist powers within societies were too strong to uh, to to learn the lesson that in an a, a post-colonial period of uh, important uh, powers exhibited by persisting persistent national mobilization, that uh, military uh, superiority does not any longer work. You look at all the, not only the examples I've given, but uh, Libya, uh, Yemen, Syria, all of these uh, venues of military intervention produced devastation, to be sure, but they didn't satisfy the objectives of those who invested lives and trillions of dollars in controlling the political outcomes. And basically, that's a constructive reality. That, that, and it's not just the United States. All the colonial wars were won by the weaker side militarily. And that's an Im terribly important lesson. And why it can't be learned is because it would undercut the profitability of the arms industry and the power of the military within governmental bureaucracies. So there's uh, so what was done after the Vietnam War was not a matter of controlling uh, uh, controlling 
involvement or the preparation, but the development of new weapons and the employment of scientists in that process, the tr effort to control the media, the, uh, the slogan in the U.S. was that the Vietnam War was lost not on the battlefield in Vietnam, but in the American living room. And the idea was that the media would be more uh, subjected to the discipline of a militarized political consciousness. Uh, let me bring these uh, remarks to an end by going back to the uh, Gaza realities for a moment and saying that the Israeli uh, practice there of genocide is in a sense a recognition of the futility of war as between two military capabilities. This is a war against people, and it's a war that can be won only by the elimination or the dispossession of people. It, it, in, in that sense, it is a correct a perverse and uh, uh, surrealistic uh, recognition of the futility of conventional war as a way of shaping politics. And, and it's a horrifying uh, reaction to that futility by resorting to uh, an explicit uh, avowal of genocide as the basis of uh, Israeli security and uh, territorial ambition, in a sense. So let me uh, end by saying I applaud the draft definition, draft declaration, which I think is a very powerful document. And I hope that this initiative will lead to a worldwide uh, process of anti-militarism and anti-war sentiment. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Richard E. Fogg, for this speech. Uh, it clearly portrays the humanitarian crisis that we are witnessing in Gaza and overall in Palestine, and why the scientists should come forward to raise their voice against war and destructive use of science and stand by the humanity. Thank you very much. So with this, uh, now we move to the second part of the program, which is the adoption of the declaration of scientists against genocide and in support of Palestine. The draft declaration is collaboratively written by the members of the International Organizing Committee. It is important to mention that the International Organizing Committee is composed of 19 scientists coming from all over the globe, representing a wide range of expertise in science and research but with different social and political understanding and approach. After many sittings, intense debates and discussions among the members, the draft was written based on common consent. In spite of the differences in their personal perceptions, all members of the committee are in full agreement with the major points of the draft declaration. For example, destructive use and militarization of science, Israeli occupation, apartheid, and genocide in Gaza, call for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza, call for an academic and scientific boycott, and to stand by Palestinian professors, scientists, researchers, scholars, and students. The present draft of the declaration reflects their ardent desire to articulate 
the scientists protest against the ongoing genocide in Gaza and to stand by the suffering people of Gaza along with their fellow scientists of the world. As you know, we shared the draft declaration with you for feedback. We have received a large number of response. We must note that the majority of the participants of this convention are in full agreement with the present draft of the declaration. We have also received a few important comments from the participants. We have collated all these comments, categorized them in clusters based on the content of the comments. Now we present before you these collated comments to seek your opinion for any modification of the declaration. The convention will adopt the final declaration at the end. Before we start the discussion on the declaration for possible amendments, let me once again remind you the rules to use Zoom, participate in the discussion, and procedure to vote for the amendments. So let me share once again the slide. So every time we shall have a discussion, we will end with a polling. And here is the rule of the polling. So that you will, once we start the polling, you will see a small pop-up window appearing on your screen with two options. And you have to choose one of them to vote or to cast your vote. So with this, now, uh, I invite Dr. Flavio Del Santo, a member of the organizing committee of the convention to discuss on the first collated comment. Dr. Flavio Del Santo is a Schrodinger postdoctoral fellow at the University of Geneva. His main research interests are the foundation of quantum mechanics, quantum information theory, as well as history and philosophy of physics. So with this, I invite Flavio to start discussion on the first collated point. Flavio. Thank you so much. Good, good evening. Well, good day, good morning, everyone, depending on your time zone. Um, so yeah, the first amendment I will be presenting should appear. Uh, all right. So um, the first suggestion we, we received is uh, on the if it can be highlighted, so is on the first paragraph, where at the very end of the first paragraph, exactly. So uh, let me read the, the last sentence. Uh, on the current draft, we have, uh, as defined by the Genocide Convention and the International Criminal Court, these acts are war crimes, crime against humanity, and genocide. Now, uh some of the of the suggestions we received from the participants have highlighted the intention of changing of adding to this sentence also the crime of uh, um ethnic cleansing now ethnic cleansing uh, let me just quickly defend this part so the 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 committee is asking you now to to vote between the current formulation and a formulation that, together with war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide, also adds ethnic cleansing. Uh, ethnic cleansing has not been recognized as an independent crime under international law. However, it has been used in resolution of the Security Council and the General Assembly of the United Nations and have been acknowledged in judgments and indictments of the International Criminal Tribunal of the former Yugoslavia several times. Therein, it has been clarified by the United Nations that ethnic cleansing, by ethnic cleansing is meant rendering an area ethnically homogeneous by using force or intimidation to remove persons of a given ethnic, racial, or religious group from the area. With this, we believe that in currently the actions of Israel are uh, uh, for sure um, implementing a form of ethnic cleansing. The difference with genocide is that genocide can be seen as an extreme of an extreme form of ethnic cleansing, where people are physically removed by murdering, killing them in the area. 
but for sure also the pressure that Israeli and their settlements and uh, illegal occupation has put on the whole land of Palestine, Palestine um, is for sure, in our opinion, a form of ethnic cleansing. So um, I think this is a, what I would like to, the, the, the background I wanted to give on this uh, additional term. And now these are the two forms uh, juxtaposed. On the left, we have the current formulation when only have war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide. Whereas on the right hand side, you see that ethnic cleansing has been added to this um, list. And uh, yeah, so I think uh, without further ado, we can move to the vote. This was my uh, presentation of this point. Okay, uh, thank you, Flavio. So then I will enable the polling on this yeah. particular point. So just give me a moment. So I shall be starting the polling option. So you will see a pop-up window appearing on your screen and it will have two options. Whether you agree on the original draft or you are agreeing with the amended draft. So here I go. So please click on the option that you want. We shall have 30 seconds to collect your vote. Okay, we stop here. I'm ending the poll. And now I share the result with you. I hope all of you can see. Flavio, can you please confirm? Yeah, I am able to see. Uh, others, I do not know. Yes. 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 Okay. So from the voting, we clearly see that the amended sentence is preferred by the majority or supported by the majority. Now I will request uh, Professor uh, Suchitra Sivastian, a member of the organizing committee and a professor of physics uh, in United Kingdom, to please take into account and update the, uh, the sentence or the part of the declaration. Okay. Thanks, ma'am. It's been updated now. Thank you. Okay. Well, with this, we shall move to the next part of our discussion. To the to discuss the next part or next collected comment. Now I shall invite Dr. Natalia Dinath, a member of the organizing committee of this convention. Dr. Dinath has a medical background. She is now a PhD candidate. She is based in Johannesburg, South Africa. She was active in the South African freedom struggle and is an active member of the organization called Science for the People. Dr. Dinath. Good day, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, so the amendment that I will propose uh, is in the uh, first um, sentence. So the original reads, we, the undersigned members of the international scientific community, strongly condemn the Israeli state's continuing genocidal attacks on the indigenous people of Palestine. There was a proposal to change that amendment Two, and I'll read the whole sentence out again. 
We, the undersigned members of the international scientific community, strongly condemn the Israeli state's continuing genocidal attacks on Palestinians who are indigenous to Palestine. This was uh, from a, a participant who um, stated that there is no single indigenous people of Palestine um, and felt that this that was uh, making an erroneous statement of fact. Uh, our original um, contention was that there is an indigenous people of Palestine and it includes Palestinians of all religions. So indigenous Palestinians of Christian, Muslim and Jewish backgrounds. Indeed, um, there is a Jewish community in Nablus on the West Bank who have been uh, Palestinian and are Palestinian for eons. Uh, and they regard themselves as indigenous Palestinian Jews. Uh, so I think that um, this is basically a um, ideological fault or fault line uh, on people who believe that there is an indigenous, uh, between people who believe that there is an indigenous people of Palestine whose rights have been taken away uh, and that there are more than one indigenous and a sort of redefined uh, group of Palestinians, um, which somehow separates the indigenous groups out into many. Uh, so I think we can call for a vote um, on, on that. Okay, thank you, Natalia. So I shall be now starting the vote on this Amendment, just give me a moment. Yes, so I'm starting. Once again, you will follow the same procedure. I hope you can see it. You have 30 seconds to cast your vote. Okay, we stop here. I end the poll. And now I share the results. As you can see, the majority of our participants supported the amended sentence. So I now request Professor Suchitra to take care of that and accordingly amend the text. Thank you very much, Natalia and Suchitra. Now we shall move to the next part of the discussion. And to discuss the next collated comment, now I invite Professor Josh Dabnau. Yes, Josh Dabnau, a member of the organizing committee of the convention. Dr. Josh Dabnau is a professor at Stony Brook University School of Medicine. His research focus is on neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's and ALS. Professor Tapna, please. Hello, everyone. I guess I can say good morning, good afternoon, good evening because of all the time zones that we are in. So um, what the, the set of comments that we received that I want to discuss today were a category um, that we received from a few participants related to a sentence that is in the first paragraph that mentions October 7th. Can you highlight that um, sentence so people can see which one we're talking about? So I'll read the sentence as it is currently written. It says, we mourn all violent deaths and deplore atrocities against all non-combatants 
of any ethnicity and nationality, including the attacks on October 7th against Israeli non-combatants. So we received a number of comments about how, whether, or in what way to mention the atrocities of October 7th. Um, these comments included a few who felt that we should delete all mention of October 7th so as not to detract from our focus on the war on Gaza. There were a few who felt that we should add an explicit condemnation of Hamas as a group rather than a condemnation of the brutal acts that took place in Israel on October 7th. Others felt that we should or should not focus our condemnation on the violence against non-combatants versus including a focus on death of, of combatants. Um, there is also a range of opinions on this question from among, among those of us who are on the organizing committee. And I should say that we discussed this particular sentence for days before finally arriving at a wording that we felt comfortable enough with. Each of us would have written this sentence slightly differently. And I would guess that each of you on this call would have also written this slightly different, differently. Um, in the end though, after much discussion of the feedback that we received, we as an organizing committee decided that it would really be an impossible task to propose one or several amendments to the sentence based on the feedback that we received. We received about a half a dozen comments and the suggestions were in many cases mutually exclusive. Um, we could have proposed half a dozen amendments for this body to choose from, but in the end, we felt that the majority of you had not made any comment on this sentence, and it felt like tampering with this sentence could result in a final document that would actually receive less support from among us rather than more support. So we hope you understand why we have decided to leave this sentence as it is, and we hope that you all will support and sign this declaration, understanding that no large community can ever be perfectly happy with every aspect of a document. Thank you, Gatsh. Thank you. Uh, now I shall move to the next part of the discussion. And for that, I invite Professor Asaf Faudi, a member of the organizing committee of the convention. Professor Fauri is a mathematician and theoretical computer scientist based at Boston University in the United States. He is an Arab American of Lebanese Palestinian background and a long time political activist. He is a member of the international organizations, Scientists for Palestine and Consultative Council of Saving Humanity and Planet Art, and a member of the US-based Radical Elders and the Academic Advisory Council of Jewish Voice for Peace, and a frequent political writer for Z, Z Network. So with this, now I request Asaf to start the discussion. Thank you, Manab. Uh, good evening. Good afternoon, good morning, everyone, wherever you are. I'd like to stress first uh, a point that uh, my colleagues in the organizing committee have already uh, talked about. That document that we're looking at was guided by a strong feeling, urge, to put a statement that could be as inclusive as possible to the majority of people who can agree on some basic principle against war, against military. And in this particular moment in time, in support of the Palestinians. So I was asked specifically to make some comments on the last but one paragraph in the draft declaration. And again, on that paragraph, like on the other paragraphs, there were many comments received by the people who have registered, making suggestions. And the one that is being highlighted, for example, right now, the word 
boycotts is mentioned. And some people had comments about that. But let me say the following. There are many parts in that statement, including that paragraph. We do not go into specifics. We as an organizing committee, we have not gone into precise specifics what to do. We're not, a, we're not organizing a political party. We come from different places politically. We have a common don denominator here. And we're trying to have to cast as wide as possible an umbrella where people who agree on the fundamentals can be part of this effort. In relation to specifics, one of the things that will be mentioned at the end of the meeting is that we hope for follow-up activities where the people who have registered, who are watching, who are part of this convention can volunteer to participate. It's not only in that paragraph that there is a lack of specifics, what to do. You can also go through the rest of the statement, the whole draft, and point out to places things can be made more specific as to what kind of possible action can be done in the future. In many ways, I'm going to get back to that point of boycott in particular. In many ways, it would be good if people in their different places, us in North America, other people in, in India, other people in Europe, South Africa, can develop their own agenda, how to pursue some of these activities depending on their local situation also. So talking about boycotts in particular, there are two dimensions that I'd like to mention. There are two aspects I would like to mention. In defense of the way we have framed that paragraph, again, as Josh mentioned, we have spent quite a bit of time, many hours, many days, back and forth, conversation, what would be a statement that would be as inclusive as possible. So I want to mention two aspects in relation to that idea, boycott and sanction and divestment. This is, it comes under the acronym that everybody has seen, most people have seen, BDS. Well, first, the first aspect I'd like to mention, there's a history to boycotts and sanction. And it's a long history from the point of view of Palestinians. It's a long struggle. I mean, in the words of the historian, Palestinian historian, Rashid Khalidi, it has gone, it has been going for more than a hundred years. So we can mention, it's not the moment to go through the history. There have been moments at different times over the last century where Palestinians with their allies have engaged in activities of boycotts, civil disobedience, strikes. I mean, the most recent one preceding, okay, going back 30 years, for example, was the first intifada. First intifada in the late 80s and the early 90s. Often what has happened in most cases, these activities have been suppressed violently, not only by the Israeli army or um, it sometimes was being undermined by a feckless Palestinian leadership. So these things have happened. So we purposely avoided in the formulation that we have in this paragraph, saying, for example, that these activities started only in 2005. It's a long history that goes back over 100 years. And the other thing, together with that is that often these activities that initiate boycotts, I'm, take, I'm talking from the point of view of someone who's living in the United States, have taken place on local initiative without direction or without uh, uh, directives coming from a centralized international body. It has happened often where uh, in my part of the United States where I am. So 
it is important the way I, we, and the group saw th this issue of boycott and sanction is to allow for local initiative to take place toward the general goal that we all agree on. Now, there's another aspect to this issue. That's the second aspect I want to mention in relation to boycotts. The targets of possible institution, organization, uh, political party that can be the targets of boycott and section action is very wide. When it comes, for example, to the issue of weapons to the Israeli state and Israeli army, everyone on this convention, this convention would agree, I hope, we should, given the, the, the reaction we had, that this has to stop. We should stop the United States giving unlimited support with arms and weapons the most advanced that are available today. Another thing that we should oppose, and we do oppose collectively, is, for example, the settlements and, and activities related to the expansion of the settlement on the West, in the West Bank. Now, when we move, there are other institutions that we can boycott, and these have been proposed. For example, Universities. Now, there's a university that happens to be in one of the settlements, Ariel University. I think part of the general uh, intention of that paragraph, it, any activity or any institution that is for the strengthening of the settlements should be opposed. And when one can definitely propose the boycott of Ariel University. There are other universities, there's a whole spectrum of educational institutions that one can look at and decide to what extent we want to put effort or you want to put effort into boycotting them. I give an example. Haifa University happens to be more than 40 percent uh, Palestinian, some with uh, most of them with Israeli citizenship. So it's a it's a 40 percent student body that is Palestinian. How do you deal with that? I can go further down on this range of possible targets. For example, Beth Salem is a human rights organization that is totally in support of the Palestinian liberation. Do we boycott that? That's a question, okay? That will be left for a kind of follow-up discussion. Or for example, do we boycott the a cultural institution like the West Eastern Divan Orchestra, which was co-established by the great Palestinian scholar Edward Said. Some people have said yes. I know this from my own experience. Well, other people say no. It's, it's, it doesn't make any sense. It's counterproductive. How about, for example, the online magazine Plus Nine Seven Two? It is a, an Israeli uh, online magazine, totally anti-Zionist. Most of the people who are writing, all of them who are writing with that magazine, are part of the struggle for Palestinian liberation. There are other institutions. We need to take a position. You need to take a position whenever you go in the follow-up activity that you will do, wherever you are. Another group that has been active I mentioned it, it's not very well known. It's called Zohra. And what is that one? It's, it's a cultural institution run by Israeli, totally focused on bringing the Nakba, recognition of the Nakba, the Nakba, the, the word is in Arabic, the catastrophe of 1948. That's their entire focus. Now that group is part, it's run by Israelis, Israeli Jews, but it is very much part of the Palestinian struggle. And one has to make a decision. You have to do it locally, wherever you are. Is it part of the things you would like to include in the boycott or not? So these things are there. So I said all of that in defense of the way we have framed that paragraph. So this is the last but one paragraph. 
where the word boycott is mentioned and it doesn't specify specific action to follow. And in many ways you can say the specifics or we say, or you can say with us, or we, is that the specific of boycotts and sanctions should be something taken up, something to be taken up by people who agree on the general gist of that statement and they will activate locally, whatever they are, following the general guidelines that are proposed in this, uh, in this statement. Uh, I'm going to stop here and I'm going to ask the moderator, uh, Manab, yes. if you can give a chance to Professor Richard Falk to, to make comments on, on the different proposals. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Professor Falk. Uh, Is he here? Uh, can somebody confirm if he's here? Yeah. Uh, yes. I think this has been a very stimulating uh, discussion and brought up the complexities of the uh, issues, uh, particularly the uh, this most recent uh, set of comments by my friend Asaf. But uh, and I. Uh, feel that the b basic uh, ideas that he put forth are the best way of handling the, uh, these comp uh, a complex issue of uh, what should be done. It's really a question of uh, asking what should be done. And the guidelines that one can provide uh, generally should be interpreted in light of the specific place and outlook that one is situated in throughout the world. And so there would be one set of initiatives in Japan and another in South Africa and another in US that would be appropriate. Maybe each of them with the same name of BDS or boycott, but having a content that is uh, contextualized in relation to the particular country. I did have one reaction to the uh, the, the first uh, amendment uh, that, uh, from a a technical point of view, it's a rather confusing formulation because the Genocide Convention doesn't define anything other than genocide, yet the sentence can be read as if it, uh, as the, uh, that these other crimes are somehow uh, derivative from the condemnation of genocide. I think that uh, would be a misunderstanding of at least the international law uh, notions that these are uh, distinct uh, areas of criminality and uh, possibly some effort at uh, reef. I, I know it's probably uh, too late to make this kind of comment, but uh, uh, I think it could be clarified and not subject to uh, misunderstanding. Uh, let me stop there. Thank you. Um, with this, uh, we are very, we are actually closing the discussion part of this program. And let me thank uh, all the speakers of this discussion session, uh, Flavio, Natalia, Josh, and Asaf, including Professor Richard.
and now we shall move towards the voting of the enter declaration and let me again um one second manab yes, i'm yes, so taking into account professor mm -hmm. richard fox comments yes so the sentence is now the same but the as defined by the genocide convention the international criminal court is moved to the end so it's associated with genocide uh professor fox is, is that more accurate now so now it reads uh, these acts a war yes. crime against against humanity ethnic cleansing and a genocide as defined by the genocide convention and the international criminal court yes that's very good editorial surgery that you performed <laughs> very quickly <laughs> no i think that's very that completely clears that up thank you thank you suchitra as well as thank you professor richard so with this now we shall move towards voting of the declaration and finally adopting it so now i move towards just a minute yes the polling and this is here so again you will be given 30 seconds to cast your vote with two options i think you can see it now you can cast your vote if you agree with the amended draft, please click, click on that. If you don't agree, you also click on the other option. Uh, Sh Shuchitra, if you can also uh, share the other document in parallel, is it possible now? Because I see some message. The one before the amendments? Correct. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Yes. So uh, I think it's better that I relaunch the poll once again. And uh, now you have the entire document. And obviously, I think it is two page document. So I think, uh, Suchitra, you can scroll both of them a bit. And then, I meanwhile, I, we, we, we go for the poll. So I'm relaunching the poll. Once again, you please cast your vote. And you have 30 seconds. Okay, we stop here and now let me share the results. I think you can see it right on your screen as it reads 97% of our attendees, participants of this convention supported the amended draft of the declaration. With this, the convention is adopting the amended full declaration. Now I shall move to the end part of the convention. So, yes. Uh, 
Professor Sukitra, you may you may now uh, unshare the document. So I thank, we thank all the attendees for their participation and for adopting the declaration of the convention. Now we are sharing a Google form to collect your endorsing signatures for the declaration on the chat box. I request uh, Josh, if you kindly share the, the Google form. Yes, we have received, that. yes, Josh, please. Yeah, thank you. It, it is shared in the chat, yes. Yes, thank you. We have received very important suggestions for follow-up actions after this convention. However, considering such suggestions and their execution requires much more planning, requires more active hands, resources, and coordinations. This is clearly outside the scope of this convention. However, we do take these suggestions seriously and thank the participant for proposing them. Through the course of the preparation and campaign for this convention, we have received a suggestion to form a long-term platform of scientists to oppose all war efforts and to resist the misuse of science for the destruction of humanity. The International Organizing Committee deliberated on the proposal and announces through this convention that it has decided to form a long-term platform of scientists, namely the International Union of Scientists Against War and Misuse of Science. The present International Organizing Committee of this convention will act as the standby committee in the interim period for developing, coordinating, and formalizing the platform. The bottom part of the Google form that you signed lists the option for different ways you can help in executing the follow-up activities. If you like to be part of this initiative and actively participate in the follow-up activities, please indicate your choice on the shared Google form more than one choice would also be appreciated. Now I shall move towards the last part that is vote of thanks. On behalf of the International Organizing Committee of this convention, we thank all of you on the audience for participating in the convention and cooperating for smooth conduction of the program. We'd also, we would also like to thank to all my colleagues in the International Organizing Committee for their voluntary labor to help in diverse jobs in connection with organizing this meeting. Special thanks to the drafting subcommittee for the tremendous work they have done in preparing the draft document, never losing sight of the basic purpose of holding this convention. We'd like to thank Breakthrough Science Society, which initiated this activity, but then handed over the charge to the International Organizing Committee without interfering in any way. And we thank also the organizations like Science for the People, Saving Humanity and Planet Earth, and Scientists for Palestine, and the Gift of the Givers Foundation, for endorsing the convention and the declaration. We'd also like to thank our technical team for smooth working of the Zoom. With this and a hope to see an active international union of scientists against war and misuse of science in the near future, we conclude the convention here. Thank you very much. <laughs>